Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. The urgent need for affordable housing in New York City is dramatically increasing, and homelessness is once again making news. Our subject today on the Urban Agenda is housing. First, let's go over some of the sobering statistics about housing in New York City today. Our population has grown to more than 8 million, and there are only 2.8 million housing units in the city. Citywide vacancy rates have dropped to an all-time low of 3.2 percent, which means that there are virtually no apartments available, especially for lower-income New Yorkers. More than 36,000 people, including 15,000 children, are homeless and sleeping in city shelters. And one out of four New Yorkers spends at least half of their income on rent. Joining me now is Ronald Schiffman, a professor at Pratt Institute and director of Pratt's Center for Community and Environmental Development. And Joe Weisbord, staff director of Housing First, a coalition of more than 200 organizations dedicated to solving the affordable housing crisis. Welcome to you both. Thank Thanks, you. David. You've seen some statistics. Uh, we just had it on the screen here. Uh, what do they mean? Uh, is this the worst of times for the city of New York? What are we seeing with these kinds of uh, vacancy rates and homelessness? Uh, arguably, we're seeing the worst housing uh, crisis that this city's faced in, in nearly 50 years. Um, we're seeing the culmination of several long-term trends, stagnant incomes among our low and moderate income New Yorkers, we're seeing uh, rising housing costs in real terms, uh, dropping housing production, and an all-time low in terms of government involvement in the production and preservation of housing. And so the, the combination of these things has uh, results in the kinds of uh, crisis that you're seeing there. And Ron, do you think this is just the beginning, or what, what, what do you take away from this? Uh, I think it's going to get worse over the next four to five years. The complete withdrawal of the city, the state, and the federal government, primarily the federal government, from production of housing is really, I think, a, a major uh, contributor to this problem we're having. It's interesting. Uh, the Community Service Society just did a poll that's about to be released uh, of 800 low and moderate income New Yorkers, actually. I hate to say it, one of the larger polls ever, ever conducted of the low-income uh, population. And the bullet on the chart for people uh, is housing problems, and they want focus on housing. Uh, but I think it's clear that we're not getting much focus. We have a gubernatorial election about to ha happen. We have congressional elections. Uh, we don't hear much about housing. Uh, Joe, what, what's your take on why aren't the politicians mm -hmm. following where the voters, and there are a lot of voters here, Absolutely, and it's it's interesting because when you talk to elected officials about their constituent service concerns, housing comes up again and again as the thing that they get, that they hear from their constituents, and yet it somehow hasn't risen um, to a major political issue in the way that it, in the way that it, that, that the situation demands. Um, I think that one of the problems that we have is this sort of sense of throwing up our hands. This is a chronic, endemic uh, problem, much the way we thought about crime perhaps 10 or 15 years ago in the city. It's something we just, we're just going to have to live with. In fact, what the history shows is that we very effectively have dealt with the city's housing needs when government has had active participation. But Ron, you know, obviously we've been watching the disinvestment by the feds. I think it was uh, about $50 billion at its high point. And now I think the numbers have dropped to $25 billion and New York being the primary victim of this. Uh, how are we going to get these kinds of issues back on the federal agenda? Well, I think the $25 billion is actually even misleading because there's very little production money coming from the federal government. There are ongoing subsidies and uh, commitment to uh, renovate some housing here and there. But on the whole, there's very little that's going into production, and there really needs to be a paradigm change. And that's not going to take place unless we uh, really reverse the congressional uh, balances that now exist and get new leadership on a national level. We've got to start focusing on how we can do it 
on the city and the state level, how we begin to build up from a local level, and then at one point get the kind of leadership we haven't had in New York for a long period of time that begins to call on Washington uh, to really address these issues. Joe, what's your take on this? I, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's really notable that last week um, we had Mayor Menino in Boston, we had Mayor Hahn in LA, we had mayors of other major cities were focused on calling for a new production program in Washington. We're testifying in front of Congress and New York, which arguably has more to benefit from such an initiative than any other city Wasn't in the country, was, was really absent. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's just talk about the city. Um, uh, I sit on the Independent Budget Office uh, uh, advisory. Uh, we're hearing numbers of perhaps as much as a budget hole in the coming fiscal year of $5 billion, $6 billion. Where's the money going to come for an affordable housing effort? And where should we be talking about? I mean, are there any sources of money that we know about? Like well, there, there are a number of sources. First of all, there, there is this money coming from the federal government to rebuild New York after the attack. While it focuses on lower Manhattan, there isn't any reason with some innovation and some leadership from our senators that we couldn't use that money creatively to build low and moderate income housing. Well, in fact, both you've in led, New York yeah. and in, in, in both in Lower Manhattan as well as in some of the uh, other boroughs. Now, the now, you've been working on a plan for just that. Uh, we've been working on a plan. We've been trying to get the city and the state to focus the use of Liberty Bond money, the use of some of the FEMA money, the use okay, of community development. Okay, we're going to have to, for our viewer, rate. explain what okay. is Liberty Bonds. I, it sounds like, uh, you know, First World War. What, what are the Liberty Bonds? Well, it, it's like a First World <laughs> War. It, it's basically a, uh, a, a special set aside by the federal government coming to New York City to provide below market. Uh, interest loans for the production of housing. It's geared to the marketplace. So it reduces the cost of what the marketplace can provide, but it uh, can also provide low-income housing if it's used creatively. And to, up till now, the governor is intent on only using it to benefit the top uh, of 5% of the New York City income bracket. And how do they justify that? I have no, well, their justification is they want to get a uh, building underway, they want to uh, reinforce the real estate fabric of Lower Manhattan. It seems to me that that is an outrage given the fact that the people who lost their jobs and the people who lost their lives could not afford to live in the housing that is now being proposed by the governor to be built on the site that we lost those buildings or in adjoining that site. You also mentioned FEMA. How does FEMA work? Well, this FEMA, by the way, is the Federal Emergency Management money. That money is unearmarked, and the city can actually go back to the federal government and say, look, one of the things we need in order to create jobs, in order to create housing, to serve the population that basically were the heroes and the victims of that attack, that what we need to do is build affordable housing in lower Manhattan and in some of our low-income communities, which took an enormous hit, although you don't read about that in the press. Joe, you lead Housing First. Would you tell our viewers how you operate and how it's working on trying to get affordable housing online? Sure. Uh, it's really a, a collective call to action that's brought together an unprecedented diversity of organizations, community-based groups, businesses, civic groups, labor, religious leaders, um, all focused on promoting solutions to the housing crisis. And I think what sets housing apart maybe is that the solutions aren't that elusive. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of, of resources and political will. And Ron talked about some of the resources that potentially are available for Lower Manhattan. We've been um, promoting a 10-year, $10, $10 billion housing production initiative. And the, the irony of that, of course, is that the city already spends a lot of money for housing. And yet, rather than rather than preserving those investments, we've seen those eroded over time. And in the most recent budget, uh, there was an 18 percent cut in uh, capital, bu capital funding for housing. Um, so we need to turn that trend around. And in terms of how much success you guys are meeting, what, what's the responsiveness you're getting, for instance, from the Bloomberg administration at this point? Ron? Um, I think the jury's still out. Uh, 
we've been able to meet with the deputy mayor, with the uh, de doctor off's right. office, with the staff. They're taking a look at our proposals. I think they're going to go far beyond what the governor is doing. Uh, I think that's we're pretty assured of that. How far they'll go, we don't know yet. Uh, the city council has basically adopted the base the recommendations that we put forward, mm -hmm. uh, and so right now. I'm quite optimistic that we'll get movement on the local level. Uh, we really need the governor to come back because he controls a well, lot of those have monies. You, have as you well. heard either of you heard anything on the gubernatorial race in terms of interest in in the housing issue? Has there been any you know position papers issued? I'm, I'm wondering. I, again, our poll you know stunned me. Yeah. Uh, in our poll, we heard nothing about rebuilding Lower Manhattan. By the way, right. and. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I assume yeah. uh, that shouldn't be any shock, but I was shocked. Yeah. Um, and we heard very little about, um, you know, issues that I think the politicians keep talking about, uh, but a lot about housing and employment yeah. issues, uh, not surprisingly. Right. But I don't hear it. There doesn't seem to be much connection here. No, I think it's, it's it, frankly, it's a little mystifying. In fact, the, the, all the gubernatorial candidates had posted uh, position papers on issues of, you know, I'd say of relatively lesser importance before they managed to, uh, to, to get, get the word out on housing. Um, and I think partly it may be, uh, it may be part of the upstate, uh, downstate dynamic, but clearly here in the city, this is a major crisis and it, and it really requires um, so a turnaround in political will and action. And talking to our federal representatives, I mean, we have a big delegation. Uh, this is one of the biggest delegations, even with yeah. all the contraction mm -hmm. of New York State mm -hmm. and the rest. Uh, is there much action going on in terms of putting housing back on the, the agenda in, in the federal government? I mean, the Democrats do control, you know, one house. Uh, are we hearing anything on that side? I, I'm not hearing anything. I think there's been uh, a total surrender to uh, the right wing in this country around these issues. It's not very popular to talk about housing in many areas of the country because of the uh, uh, because it, it's not as critical an issue there because they don't have the growth and the dynamism of New York City. Uh, but it is the issue of affordability in New York is critical. The issue of preservation in New York is critical, as it is in many other cities across the nation. And right. the mayor has to take the lead. And this is part of what we've been pushing him to do, uh, and, and Dr. Off to do, is to take the lead in meeting with the other mayors and creating some sort of new urban agenda, an urban consortium to raise the issue of housing, to raise other urban issues of critical importance. Uh, nope. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has made affordable housing its top priority, and yet again, New York is not actively engaged in that in that effort. Um, and I think that's going to be critical, and that will bring the delegation along. So we have members who sporadically have made some important contributions, but it hasn't been a constant theme. And that's what it's going to take to move federal legislation: is a long-term commitment to this issue. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. In America, you are not required to offer food to the hungry or shelter to the homeless. There is no ordinance forcing you to visit the lonely. In fact, nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have to provide anything for anybody. Thank you for all you've given. Imagine what more could do. We're talking about the critical need to provide affordable housing in New York City with Ronald Schiffman of Pratt Institute and Joe Weisborg from Housing First. Joe, what can we, we're talking long distance problems in terms of how we're going to get housing back into the city of New York. Are there short term uh, efforts that, for instance, Housing First is talking about uh, to try to come up with new uh, affordable housing? Absolutely, and this is obviously this is part of a long-term effort, but we need to start now, and I think that's absolutely critical. We need to preserve the, the funding that's in the capital budget. Um, we need to ensure that funds that have traditionally been spent for housing in New York City, like community development block grant dollars, aren't siphoned off to other uses. Like what, what um, could they be used for? Don't they have to Other go? kinds of capital projects that are eligible under the federal grant program. I see. Um, we need to 
we need to set some goals for ourselves. We haven't had a major production initiative in New York City for a long time, not since the Housing New York program that was initiated Koch. By, by Mayor Koch. Right. Um, we need to set some ambitious goals for ourselves, put a stake in the ground and start, and as the city's financial fortunes turn around, allocate the resources that are needed. Now we can start doing some planning work. We can suspend the unrestricted auction of city-owned land, um, one of the small but, but important remaining resources for development. We can really plan that on a, on a community-based level and identify the best uses and identify the opportunities, marry it to privately owned resources um, so that we have the places to build this housing. Um, that's going to be a critical first step. Ron, one of the difficulties we're having, I think, as advocates generally on um, for the poor and the working poor and even people of moderate incomes, uh, after the attack on the uh, World Trade Center, um, all the resources that are being talked about have been uh, at least talked about going to Lower Manhattan. Uh, why shouldn't that be, you know, they were the, the buildings came down, why shouldn't that be where the money goes? I've heard that from a lot of different sources. I mean, those were the primary uh, you know, structures that were hurt, that's where money should go, right? Well, obviously, the structures did come down and uh, the area had a really negative impact as a result of their destruction. However, what we don't really hear about is that over 60 percent of those who lost their jobs, and it's roughly 100,000 jobs that were lost, uh, 60 percent of them, or 60,000 jobs, were people who earned under $23,000 a year. That's low income. They weren't living in Battery Park City. They, and 80% of them lived in the neighborhoods outside of Manhattan. And if you begin to take a look at that, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or an urban planner to realize those are our low income communities of color and new immigrant communities in New York. And if you go to the housing courts and if you go to the food kitchens in those areas you will see dramatic increases in the numbers of people being evicted people who are facing foreclosure as well as people who can no longer afford to feed their kids we've got to use a lot of that money to address those issues not only in lower manhattan but in the communities that were homes to many of these people and that's what what was attacked was New York City. Right. The people who suffered, uh, a colleague of mine uh, uh, refers to this as being, Lower Manhattan was the epicenter of the earthquake, but the destruction took over mm -hmm. in many other parts of the city. And we have to use that analogy and just, understand Just to that. confirm what you're saying, uh, in the survey that I, I mentioned earlier, um, of the 800 people uh, in the low income category, more than 50% had five problems that had hit them over this past year and it was almost invariably housing related. They fell behind in their rent, they were uh, threatened or were evicted, um, they uh, suffered utility bill cutoffs. Uh, so what you gentlemen are talking about is clearly coming back in the statistics when you do sort of independent polls on this issue. Um, again, I get more and more frustrated because no one seems to be listening. But one of the reasons I think no one's listening, obviously, it, uh, is the third rail now of American politics, which is the question of revenue. Where is this kind of money, which runs into the billions almost instantly, going to come? And let's talk a little bit about taxation. Is it possible? Have there been other places where they've considered property tax, uh, uh, you know, or targeted uh, taxes? No. It's, it's, it's interesting because there's a number of places in the country that have set up dedicated revenue streams targeted to affordable housing and places that have done it because all the residents have acknowledged that meeting the housing needs of those who have been uh, squeezed out of the market is important to the welfare of the entire city and to the economy of the entire city. So Los Angeles recently adopted a $100 million a year ho local housing trust fund. On the city of Seattle just a week or two ago, the voters passed a real estate tax levy that was dedicated to affordable housing development, and it in fact passed with broad bipartisan support. So I think there, you know, we need to get ourselves out of this sense that this is a chronic problem, or out of the mindset that these are sort of political realities that are fixed, and start being more, being more imaginative about what the possibilities are. 
Ron, are you hearing more willingness to discuss the issue of uh, dedicated revenue? Or are there other dedicated revenue well, that we're not even exploring here? First of all, there are a lot of other dedicated revenues, and uh, Joe's absolutely right. right. The issue here, however, is the mindset. Right. And, for instance, I've been involved in many of the debates around Lower Manhattan. And when you talk about putting in $4.5 billion to build a new transit center down there, which we need, and I'm not opposed to it, uh, people say, oh, yes, let's put the money in it. When you talk about putting in the civic amenities, the parks, uh, opening up the waterfront in Lower Manhattan, people say, oh, we have the money, let's, let's do that, let's put it in there. When you talk about affordable housing, they raise the question, where are we going to get the money? And, it, and you have to understand that shift. In one case, it's the deserving people of the city of New York, the, the commuters coming into the city, uh, the people who live in lower Manhattan. These are basically income transfers to the wealthy. And what we need to understand is that if we want to really have an equitable society, and that's the way we should be thinking about memorializing the event, making it more democratic, making it more... Uh, uh, more equitable. Then we have to start saying, let some of those income transfers benefit the vast majority of New Yorkers who desperately need housing. And, and that's a mindset. And change. clearly in our work at the Community Service Society on the issues of poverty, we have this fight all the time. Uh, but those numbers we saw early on in this program of now nearly 36,000 people in homeless shelters, that's not only a, a question of equity. This is starting to have another drain on city resources that is going to hit the tax, the, 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 you know, whether it's, we're not even being ethical now. Uh, this, if this continues at this rate of growth, the city, because of court rulings and the rest, is having to, going to have to pay more and more money to preserve people in substandard conditions. Does, do people get it? I, I, I... I'm not sure, but I think what, what's clear is that the cost of sheltering people, which I think is going to be upwards of half a billion dollars yeah. um, th this coming year, is just the most visible and easily quantifiable yeah. cost. We have negative uh, uh, economic impacts of the housing crisis that go far beyond just the cost of the shelter system. There's a growing volume of research and data showing that uh, overcrowding, uh, uh, physical, poor physical conditions, uh, excessive rent burdens have, um, neg and, and frequent moves have negative impacts on educational attainment for children. They have uh, negative impacts on health outcomes for children and adults. They have negative impacts on workforce success for adults. It's a major cause of, um, of foster care placements, purely housing. Um, so, and not to mention, you know, a whole, so and we, don't, we don't have a fix on the full economic uh, cost and, of this, and, but and it's, it's obviously that tremendous. Another, another it's issue. Where's the business it? community here? I mean, look, we went through, obviously, under the ro leadership of uh, David Rockefeller Jr., a great, you know, when the city was in financial trouble, there was an enormous investment by the business community in demanding things that were generally not necessarily immediately seen as business as issue. Are we seeing any concern by the business? These are their workers. The messengers, the typists, the, the rest, where, what's going on here? I, I think the mayor understands this, and that's what's giving us some hope. Uh, Joe did a wonderful thing a couple of months ago. He taped a speech by the mayor, which we now use as the preamble to our plan, where he basically said it was a, one of the needs for the city's economy is really to rebuild housing for all income groups in the city, that we really need to address the affordable housing uh, issue in New York. But the... On the whole, the business community has been very narrow-minded. They're very much controlled by the real estate interests, uh, and the real estate interests in Lower Manhattan have a very, very uh, uh, narrow perspective of the city's needs. New York City needs to do a number of things. One is to become somewhat independent of the real estate control over its policy and its politicians. Secondly, it needs to really think about how it diversifies its economy so it benefits more people. Uh, we've got to start thinking about this in broader terms than just housing if we really want to address the housing the, the issues. The diversification uh, issue has, was, was really has been graphically shown yeah. now because we're so de dependent upon the financial sector and didn't have even, you know, sort of high-tech, biotech, whatever it was yeah. to offset the losses, 
I mean, that's why we're in such or a hole now. Tech of just or old tech, tech and, and, it's and, true. I think it's interesting that, it, and I think there is a growing awareness in the business community, and we've had some, uh, some major corporate interests who've supported our campaign and have been active in it. Um, so there's a growing awareness. Um, but the you know industries like education and healthcare, which are major employers and which have an institutional investment in the city, uh, New York University isn't going to move to uh, <laughs> to um, uh, 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 New Jersey. <laughs> Um, or <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, but uh, or the major hot, you know, Mount Sinai Medical Center isn't going to move to mm. New Jersey. Um, these are the largest employers in the city, and they are being killed by the housing crisis because they are trying to recruit highly talented uh, faculty and administrators um, who have opportunities all over the world. Um, and housing costs become a major factor in their recruitment. They're not making Wall Street salaries. Well, I hope um, you gentlemen are right about the business community, and I want to thank uh, both Ronald Schiffman, director of Pratt Institute's Center for Community and Environmental Development, and Joe Weisbord, staff director of Housing First. New York City is in danger of becoming a city divided, with the wealthy living in luxury apartments and working poor in slums. This trend is economically short-sighted and socially dangerous. We urge governmental and private sector action to fund and stimulate efforts to provide safe and affordable housing for all. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Thank you for watching The Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.